welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to uh, this presentation. Um, just so that you are aware with the chat box in Zoom, if you have questions or comments throughout uh, Paul's presentation, please put them in the chat box or hold them until the end. I'll uh, copy them out of the chat box and make sure that we get to them and I'll save them for Paul to answer at the end. Um, and uh, let's see, this video is being recorded. So just keep in mind later, we'll have this available up on YouTube. You can share it with other friends and colleagues that uh, weren't able to make it here today. And I also wanted to, um, Derek didn't ask to do this, but I am doing this for him uh, anyway, because I think that this is just so much fun. Um, uh, Derek has a new children's book. Um, both he and his wife created. It's it's really wonderful. It's called There's a Dinosaur in My Tree, How Theropod Dinosaurs Became Birds. And um, it's a really fun children's book. I am ordering a couple for friends who of mine who have kids. I'm going to put the link in the chat just in case you're interested. Uh, but I wanted to give him a little plug for that. Um, let's see. And I if I'm looking over this direction, it's because I'm looking at my other screen. I've got too many screens up here. Uh, okay, so uh, let's welcome Paul today. I'm just going to do a little quick introduction. So Paul Basich is our presenter for today. Uh, he's been an active birder since his early teens in New York City. His interests include bird conservation and policy, as well as studies in avian breeding biology, waterfowl ecology, and the practice of bird feeding. Among his many activities, he worked for the American Birding Association in multiple roles, has worked for the National Wildlife Refuge System on a consultant basis on issues of popular birding and uh, um, parallel refuge receptiveness, and has led or co-led um, trips to places such as Alaska and Cuba. In addition, Paul co-edits with Wayne Peterson, the popular monthly birding community e-bulletin, and in 2014, he received the Ducks Unlimited Wetland Conservation Achievement Award in the category of communications. Uh, he's also an accomplished author and related bird topics, including feeding wild birds in America, which he, I have here, which without my blur, you're not really going to be able to see. <laughs> uh, but he co-authored that with Margaret Barker and Carol Henderson, as well as the uh, Princeton Field Guide uh, to Nests, and my blur is not going to let you see it, Nests, Eggs, and Nestlings of North American Birds, uh, co-authored with Colin Harrison. I'm really looking forward to this presentation today. Uh, so welcome, Paul. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Let me say a few things before I put on uh, my PowerPoint. Um, Sounds good. This is, this is my first experience with an international presentation. And some of what I say, uh, my apologies to Derek and others from South Africa, will be peculiarly and particularly North American when I refer to certain species and, and locations, and I'll apologize in advance. You know, when, when, we're, when I talk about blackbirds or orioles, I'm talking about our blackbirds uh, not, uh, and orioles, not necessarily um, ones which may um, be or not be in uh, the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, when I'm talking about hummingbirds, you don't even have hummingbirds. When I'm talking about flycatchers, I'm talking about our flycatchers, our tyrant flycatchers, which are totally different from flycatchers in the old world. So uh, having apologized in advance, um, I'll uh, proceed by saying another apology. I'll be talking about some geography here, and I'll have a slide or two on geography. Um, but realizing that the United States of America is really close to a whole bunch of countries, actually four or five to be precise, excluding the fact that you can see uh, Siberia from Wales, Alaska, and I've seen Siberia from Wales, Alaska. Uh, the United States touches or is very close to uh, a few countries, Canada, obviously, to our north, mostly to our north, excluding uh, Alaska and Hawaii, um, Mexico to our south, uh, the Bahamas to our southeast, most immediately, and Cuba 
uh, so-called 90 miles away from Key West. We are so close and yet so far. Sometimes Americans don't follow what goes on in those countries, in those locations. And I think that's particularly true in the largest, when you consider the largest island of the Caribbean, Cuba. Uh, there is also lots of misunderstanding, and we'll probably touch on some of that as we move along here. Uh, there's an old saying, an old Mexican saying, that goes back maybe 150 years. And the Mexicans say, poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. And this is also uh, a predicament which uh, deal we, we neutrally deal with our Cuban neighbors. And it'll be part of the background of what I'm talking about. So let me go to screen sharing and start my official presentation. Can you see that, Krista? Yep, we can see it. Thanks, Paul. And you can see my, my uh, arrow here. Great. My yep. presentation is on um, birding and beyond in Cuba, not just birds and where to find them and how to find, how to find them, uh, opportunities and lessons. I'm going to describe the bird ecotourism scene, vital bird conservation scene in Cuba, with details on the fascinating birds, with details on our hardworking counterparts on the island. And um, making a difference for both. Around the photos here, Krista and friends, you'll see a border. And the border in this one is black. And it's a color code. Black means it's my photo. And my apologies if you are coming to this presentation to see the glorious bird photos. I'm not going to show them because I'm not a good photographer. This one is a snapshot. My color code is black. It's mine. If it's red, it's somebody else's. And if I have time, I'll mention who that, that photographer is. And if it's green, I think green is the most important border here, Krista and friends. It indicates engagement and, and our relationship to our colleagues in Cuba. So having said that, let me uh, move on here with some of the, let's see, let's see if I can move this. Can I move this? Yes, terrific. Uh, these are our some of our counterparts four friends of ours in Cuba, and they represent four different kinds of engagements, which are really important. On the left, starting from left to right, on the left is Michael Canizares. He's our regular leader um, on the trip, our Cuban uh, colleague who's usually with us on the bus. Sometimes I'll mention uh, another friend, uh, Ernesto Ruelas who also have, plays that same kind of role with Michael. But Michael here is the our usual leader. He's the former president of the Zoological Society of Cuba. Next to him is the wonderful Rosendo Martinez. He's the former head of visitors engagement in the National Park System of Cuba. He's now retired. He's a key hub creator for all kinds of creative things that go on in terms of ecotourism and and Ava tourism on the island, particularly at the Bay of Pigs area. He's um, a really creative and essential person. The third fellow with the white hat is Ronel. He's our usual bus driver. And having the right kind of bus driver is essential. They know where to stop for pit stops, for food, uh, for gasoline and other things. And the final person on the right is our friend Adrian Cobas. He represents uh, a local bird guide with a fabulous uh, casa particular, casa renta, a little rental place. It's not like, a, it's a homestay, not unlike a B&B um, &B operation at uh, Playa Larga, the Bay of Pigs. And uh, he represents uh, another aspect of what's extremely important for us. Here also are birders. Uh, we have uh, those three of those four guys uh, here. Uh, we have uh, Michael, Adrian, and Rosendo. 
And we have our dear friend Soledad, who's also on the call here. And we're looking at the back of uh, Adrian's house. We're looking at birds. And these are a number of American birds here, including my friend Larry Balsh, one of the past presidents of the American Birding Association, and his late wife, Donna. This is the second aspect, not only the local people, but the birders who come and, and uh, what we can get out of it, what they can get out of it, our mutual interaction. We'll deal with three core locations, Las Terrazas and Viñales, the Zapata Swamp, and Havana. We'll look at four side trips, the Guanajaca Vives, North Coast, Baracoa, and Topes de Cayantes. And then we'll look into, if we have the time, a very important bird trade issue, that is cage birds, equipment review for Cubans, art and culture, and as Krista indicated at the beginning, getting there. Let's look at what we're looking at. Cuba, the largest island in the Caribbean, is 42,000 square miles. It's the size for Americans, it's the size of Virginia or Tennessee, or about two thirds the size of Florida. For you South Africans, it's the size of the uh, Northwest province of uh, South Africa. For Europeans, I think there are a couple on here. It's the size of Bulgaria, Iceland, or Hungary. Not inconsequential. And it's the home, Cuba is the home to six terrestrial ecoregions, moist forests, dry forests, pine forests, wetlands, cactus scrub, mangroves. And about 20% of the island is preserved as natural areas. It's very significant. The population of the country is about 11.2 million, half men, half women, very nicely uh, distributed. Birth rate is one of the lowest in the Western Hemisphere. And by the way, the uh, uh, capital Havana has about two and a half million people. The ethnic makeup is complicated, according to uh, preconceived categories in the study um, a dozen years ago. Um, most of it is uh, genetically uh, connected, 72% European, 20% African, about 7% indigenous, and about 1% Asian, emphasizing Chinese and Japanese. And by the way, the sites that we are visiting, let's see, that I mentioned before, Let's see, there are um, Las Terrazas and Viñales over here, Zapata Swamp over here, Havana over here, Topes de Cayantes over here, the North Coast in this general area, Baracoa on the extreme east end of the island, and Oaxaca Vives on the west end of the island. The birds are fascinating. There are about oh, 300 and almost 400 bird species have been found on the island. Endemics, about 26 of them, 22 are of national or international conservation concern. Among them are some spectacular birds, such as bee hummingbird number four here, Cuban Blackhawk number eight, Zapata Wren number 18, there, Cuban Toady number 12, Cuban Trogon number 11, and Fernandina Flicker number 14. These are, this is all artwork by Niels Navarro in his book on the endemic birds of Cuba, and we'll see Niels a little later. The last trip, I think, and uh, Soledad can correct me, I think we got about 23, 24 of the 26 endemics. Some of these are impossible to get because uh, they may very well be, they may be extinct, like the Cuban macaw here, or close to extinction. But we do quite well in a short trip. First trip, first visit, we'll do the Las Terrazas and Vinales area, one of my favorite. We will invariably, all trips start, almost all trips these days start in Havana. And we'll go to Las Terrazas Vinales. It's characterized what, by these haystack mountains, these mogotes, 
limestone karst mountains, uh, which are present in very few areas of the world, one of which is in the area of Southeast Asia. Here we'll get our introduction, our first introduction to birds. Here are my fabulous photographs. You can see, if you're very sharp, you can find the Cuban trogon in this picture here. That's typical of my photography. But we will also probably stumble on a Cuban pygmy owl here on the right. Very friendly. In the Las Terrasas Linales area is also a particularly important place for yellow-headed warbler, an endemic, and West Indian woodpecker on the right, a regional bird, uh, but not necessarily endemic to Cuba alone. It's very, very similar to our, for those of us in the United States in the, in the Southeast, uh, our red-bellied woodpecker. It looks like a red belly with a black eye, got punched in the face. Las Terrasas Vinales is a place where, um, here's Vinales here, it's a lovely, lovely town. Uh, we could stay at um, a number of casas particulares or maybe at one of the hotel, La Hotel Ermita. We could see and visit uh, tobacco drying barns, and we do. But one of, our, one of the main birds we might be looking for is this Cuban solitaire. Those of you Americans on here could imagine a hermit thrush, perhaps, that has gone through the washer and the dryer, and that's what a Cuban solitaire looks like. It's not terribly attractive, but its song is absolutely wonderful, an ethereal song that goes on and on. And you will hear this bird before you ever see it. You may hear it for a half hour before you ever see it. And here's our group, um, I guess it was last year, not this year, where we found at the base of one of the Mogotes where we regularly go, uh, a number of these Cuban solitaires singing. By a number, I meant three or four. This year, I think we had up to eight or 12. It was fabulous and quite remarkable. It takes some time to find it because this bird sings and doesn't move much. Las Terrasas is also important because it is a location for a reforestation project um, that was started in 1968. It's a uh, UNESCO biosphere reserve and the place of this um, eco village of Las Terrasas. Uh, it is a great place to visit. It's a great place to stay at the Hotel Mocha. It revolves around nature. It's just outside our door, and we'll bird outside the door, and all the groups going there will walk around for the morning, much of the morning, and get an introduction to the endemic birds of Cuba and migrants from the U.S. that may be coming through. At the end of the day, by the way, here's our friend Ernesto Ruelas, and our group, or part of our group, is going through the checklist. I will bring to your attention one of the green borders here where we find out about engagement. It has to do with this little thing. This is a bird feeder. This is a hummingbird feeder. We'll bring a bunch of these to the island. Here you go. They are very expensive. I'm saying that facetiously, a dollar a piece. We'll bring a dozen or more of these to give to our friends and colleagues. They can't get them on Cuba. We can buy them in the dollar store here down the street, but they can't get them. And it's very important for engaging people and attracting birds, people's homes, hummingbirds, including some fabulous ones. Having said that, in the Las Terrasas Vinales area, we may engage and find some of our first endemics, such as the olive cap warbler here in pine trees or our Cuban vireo, or our green woodpecker, one of my favorite woodpeckers, and a regional bird here, uh, which is the red-legged honeycreeper. In the area too, when there are pine trees, remember I talked about the olive cap warbler and pine trees, he said, yes, there are pine trees in Cuba, uh, where, where we pursue and look for the Stygian owl, and I don't think there's been a time that we haven't found it. 
This, by the way, is a photo from last year. One of our participants, Alan Reed, took this photo. In the area of Soroa, we might stay at the Via Soroa, little, little uh, individual rooms. And uh, we may be greeted by uh, a regional specialty, the loggerhead kingbird here, very much like the gray kingbird that comes as far north and goes to the Caribbean and as far north into uh, Florida. But it's uh, bigger and different. Soroa is has a wonderful, excellent birding orchid garden where we'll, where we'll spend we will spend one two hours depending upon what's there to get all kinds of migrants in particular and those sorts of birds. Having visited the Terrasas Vinales area, we'll then move to the Zapata Swamp. We'll go from the Vinales area to this green spot here. Zapata Swamp. This photo by Tom Hadley is of the entrance to the area. It's a national park. It's a biosphere reserve. It's a Ramsar site. It's a complex, not unlike some of the national forests in the U.S. West or in, the, uh, in Alaska with embedded villages inside this natural area. Those of you living in Florida may uh, think of Merritt Island in Florida, or those of you from my area in the uh, Delmarva area, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, may think of Chincoteague, where there is both a national seashore and a national wildlife refuge next to each other. The point is that some folks don't know where one jurisdiction ends and the other begins. This is also particular in the wonderful Zapata area. Oh, by the way, it's also like Cape Cod, where there's a national seashore, a state park, and a national wildlife refuge, Monomoy, next to each other. And sometimes people don't know uh, the difference of one to the other. The Zapata Swamp, we'll uh, go to the, uh, this, base ourselves at Playa Larga. We'll burn around the Bay of Pigs, Playa Giron, Bermeja in the interior here, Santo Tomas over here, or another location in the interior of the swamp, and we'll also drive down to La Salina over there. The entrance to Playa Larga, the Bay of Pigs, is marked here, the entrance to Playa Larga. Yes, that is a giant crab. No, it's not real, it's a statue. But it can be a jumping place. I mean, this was a characteristic the way the way it looked like, uh, bustling as it was in 2016. There were lots of uh, tourists from uh, Italy and Germany and Spain and France. The whole the whole Bay of Pigs area is a very popular uh, scuba diving area too, and popular. Uh, this is the best of times. Some of the best of times that the uh, Cuban people had uh, in the last 50 years, and it was shown at uh, Playa Larga. We would stay at a homestay, much like an Airbnb. This is a typical one, and uh, a casa particular. And we might go uh, to a restaurant like the Tiki restaurant here, or some baladadas, which are home restaurants. The buildings at Zapata Swamp, as we go birding, uh, where we're staying. Um, uh, this is a homestay operation over here. Invariably, they'll be building on top of it in expansion. There's always expansion. There has been expansion in the situation. And we'll come and visit uh, Casa Ana here. This is where Adrian Cobas uh, and his wife, Ana, are stationed. Uh, they have a little, uh, some rooms they rent. But the place to go is uh, that second photo here with engagement, the feeding station behind. Some people will go to that feeding station. I showed you that in the picture at the very beginning where we were watching uh, Bee Hummingbird uh, with Adrian and others. They'll be watching um, Black-throated Blue Warbler or Yellow-Faced Grass Quit, Black-throated Blue Warbler here, Yellow-Faced Grass Quit, or um, Parallel Warbler all day. Photographers might stay there all day. They might get a nice picture like uh, Alan Reed's photo of uh, West Indian woodpecker here coming to the feeding operation. And they'll probably get their first look at, there it is, bee hummingbird on the left. We'll see it a couple of other times 
the smallest bird in the world. That's a male, along with the Cuban emerald, uh, a much larger, much larger, twice the size of more, um, much larger photo, uh, much larger bird, hummingbird, photo here by Alan Reed. Las Salinas is a wonderful place to go. It's down here. It's 23 kilometers from uh, uh, Playa Larga to the end. Uh, it has a gravel road. We bird it to go see things like wonderful birds such as flamingos, uh, long-legged waders, shorebirds, gulls, herns, water birds, raptors. Snail kites are among the raptors here. Absolutely wonderful. Great looks, photos by James Hill. Here's my photo, a great photo on the left. You see the Cuban blackhawk, which pursues crabs, by the way, and uh, a better shot of mine later on in the same day. It is an endemic bird of Cuba. We will only see it at this part of Zapata Swamp. We might see it elsewhere. It's rather uncommon. Here we are um, with a group of birders uh, from our bus and other people who are uh, on taking a look at uh, this part of Las Salinas with a picture, yes, yet again, of the Cuban Black Hawk by James Sharp. Like I said, it's about 23 kilometers to the end of the gravel road where there's a dead end. It's wonderful stuff. There are clapper rails there also. In that area also is a wonderful place to go. Bermeja is a mini refuge. Uh, here we are leaving the refuge. Uh, as we go in and out, we can often see um, some birds from the entranceway. We may see human parrot. There are not a lot of them for us to find, but this is a good spot for it. Once we're inside, uh, we'll encounter blue-headed quail doves eating cracked corn, where one of our friends has distributed cracked corn an hour or so before we arrive, early in the morning. We will have come to a blind, and we'd look off to the left through the gap in the blind for them. But lo and behold, these um, blue-headed quail doves become so used to having us visitors uh, feed them with uh, cracked corn that they'll walk around the blind and you can see us pointing. They're walking around and they virtually come to our feet. This is one of my pictures of, you know, six blue-headed, seven blue-headed quail doves virtually at our feet on our side of the blind. Uh, once we've gotten a look at them. And on the other side is also the uh, more shy, but endemic gray-fronted dove, a photo here by James Hill. You remember that Cuban parrot that we saw entering somewhere on that road to Bermejas. We'll also see Cuban parakeets, a photo here by Gail Hampshire. Both the parrots and the parakeets have some problems in terms of the bird trade, cage bird trade, and captivity. And we'll touch on that a little later. One of the places to go to in the Zapata Swamp is a little town embedded in this area, uh, in the town of Palpite. And we'll go to another backyard. You remember visiting Adrian's backyard. This is the backyard of Bernabe Hernandez and his wife. Uh, we come there often to see uh, get close looks again at uh, Bee Hummingbird. And you'll see one of the feeders that we brought here, right there, an example of what we brought to the situation. And you see Ben and his wife. Yes, lots of feeders. We may, bring a, we may bring a dozen or more feeders with us to distribute on our trip. Another thing we brought to Ben and Bay's house, this was in 2018, we brought this particular feeder here. It's called a humbug. And here's Ernesto, Ben, Nebe, and myself. We're putting this feeder together. What is it? It's a feeder where you drop in bananas, overripe bananas, and they uh, create a mini situation 
where there are fruit flies. They, but they have a wonderful time uh, in the bananas, breed and fly around. And it serves as yet another feeder for the hummingbirds, the Cuban emerald and the bee hummingbird. Here's my, another one of my fantastic photos of a bee hummingbird. And you'll notice I put this in green to show you that this, this represents engagement with the crowd, uh, with uh, local birders. Here's the same feeder two years later. Here's a bee hummingbird, male on the top, female on the bottom. Here's our friend Ben Nebe holding one of the feeders we've given him of another style with a little bee hummingbird coming to, him, coming to it. Here it is again. Here I'm holding it with a bee hummingbird coming to it. Here is a, here is a wonderful photo. I don't know if it's real, but it should be. I found it on the internet and borrowed it. It's a, it's a picture on the right of bee hummingbird on the end of the eraser end of a pencil. It shows you its size. In Bernabe's backyard, there can be uh, Cuban Orioles. I love the Cuban Oriole because like most, unlike most Orioles, which are yellow or orange with a little black, the Cuban Oriole is mostly black with a little yellow. And it's unique in that sense, perhaps. One of my favorites is a photo by um, Francisco Vernese. Zapata Swamp, we can also go to Santo Tomas. It's one of the options. In the interior, we start early in the morning drive in, it takes an hour or so, Soledad can correct me, to go to this little town of Santo Tomas, which has its characteristic little schoolhouse with a Cuban flag and a bust of Jose Marti. Here's the uh, uh, marketplace, uh, the store for Santo Tomas, and a full-sized mural of the Ferminia, the um, Ren, the, the Zapata Ren that we're going after here. What do you do in this location? Oh, by the way, um, also having to do with the town of Santo Tomas, here's the school. Here's Michael speaking to the school teacher and the visiting doctors. Visiting doctor visits uh, on a, would visit on a regular basis with the school teacher and just a couple of kids. It's a very small village. And here's the classroom, classroom where we would uh, give them some coloring books bird coloring books, which we'll see later. Unfortunately, this town during the pandemic had to be depopulated and the people were encouraged uh, to get uh, into the town of uh, um, Playa Larga. Um, in any case, from here, we would get on a channel that goes out into the swamp that was built uh, 100 years ago, actually 110 years ago, 1915, to go out to see uh, Zapata Rent. And we go out in the pole boats, and there's Michael looking at us as we go out on this channel. On the way out, we will see uh, Zapata Sparrow. It's a special place to see the, Zapata, the endemic Zapata Sparrow, characteristic of that spot. And we'll go out onto a platform and wait and play a tape for a while and wait and wait. And then we'll finally see my fabulous photos of the Ferminia, the um, Zapata Wren, both here and there. But here's a decent picture of that very bird by uh, David Beebe. Uh, one of our opportunities for engagements for the guys who helped us pull out there, uh, our buddy Michael uh, will help distribute, in this case, it was some baseball caps uh, from 2017 that we distributed. The blue caps were from the uh, Chicago Cubs. We had a couple of Chicago natives with us, and they uh, distributed Chicago Cub hats, having won the previous World Series. We go back to the town of Playa Larga and go to the beach, or we can, on um, one or another location uh, opportunity, take an alternative and go to our very own uh, cenote, our limestone sink, and have our own pool operation. Uh, having walked in about 45 minutes and uh, swim uh, in this uh, wonderful location. Havana's next. Having left the great location of Zapata Swamp, we go north and a bit west to Havana. Havana is a fascinating city 
different levels of repair and disrepair, but mostly repair these days. Uh, the ancient cars from the 1950s seen here, uh, Chevys, Pontiacs, Buicks, Plymouths, etc. cetera. Uh, the uh, old presidential palace. We see more cars here from our uh, our, our uh, rooms at the at the uh, the equivalent of the casa de renta, the rental rental house, or rental apartment that we have. These are uh, all 1950s convertibles. We see Oldsmobiles in the streets and Pontiacs, but we also do some serious birding there. Here's my friend Larry Balch. We're at the uh, here, and our driver Ronell. We're at the very famous uh, Hotel Nacional where there are red-legged thrushes in the backyard and warblers uh, as we're drinking mojitos and uh, enjoying uh, the view. In Havana, we'll also take uh, a detour to uh, the uh, university. Here, we will visit our friends Alieni and Lourdes on the left and right and make sure that they get some of the coloring books that Soledad has prepared on the birds of Cuba so that they can use it with the kid education that we were uh, we're engaged in. And Derek in particular here will uh, take note and, and appreciate this, uh, this book for kids, this coloring book. Here's a picture of my daughter, uh, Judith, of our first visit to Cuba back in 2006. She's checking uh, a visitor's guide. We didn't know where we were beyond the fact that we were at the famous steps of the uh, Havana University. There are different kinds of um, houses, um, fascinating looking places next to places that are in quite disrepair, need to be repaired. There are hotels here that have an old face front and a new interior. And there are different kinds of uh, buildings here, places where we stay, such as up here, uh, and Soledad uh, introducing us to uh, the rooms that we have for ourselves across the way from the uh, presidential palace. Plenty of birds in Havana, brown pelican, Antillian palm swift, royal tern, Cuban martin, peregrines sometimes uh, in the wintertime at the uh, odd buildings looking to feast on, yes, Eurasian collared doves. It's a wonderful walk on to see the Castillo at the, at the mouth of the harbor or to walk along the famous Malecon but one of my favorite places for burning in the Havana area is the Jardin Botanico Nacional, the Botanical Gardens uh, of Havana. Cuban Botanical Gardens, it's about uh, 65 kilometers uh, out of town, 600 hectares, 4,000 plants. This is a Cuban metal arc here that our friend Niels Navarro insists is going to be a good species. It doesn't sing like Western or Eastern metal arc. It is a resident, non-migratory, and it's on the list of uh, soon-to-be split um, species that exists only in uh, in Cuba. Wonderful look at uh, the uh, Japanese garden here. A good look at American kestrels, two flavors, both the Rufus uh, and the light-breasted uh, variant. Uh, and an old motorbike in the background, which is uh, typical of uh, what goes on in Cuba. Soviet era uh, machine, uh, not far, being repaired and re-repaired, not far from the Japanese Botanical Gardens. Havana is great. In the Botanical Gardens, you can get common gallinules, smooth bill oddies, and great lizard cuckoos. And I see that I'm already 40 minutes into this, so I'm going to take us quickly through the four side trips, Guanajuato Vives here in the east, the north coast, Baracoa here on the west, and Topes de Cayantes, Coyantes in the interior there. Guanajuato Vives is a neat location on the western edge of Cuba. Lovely beaches, great places for snorkeling and scuba diving. Specialists who come all over the world, not only to go to the Bay of Pigs, but uh, to uh, this location here. It's a great uh, bird banding site. My friend Ernesto with bird band, Cuban bird banders, and a wonderful cent center, visitor center 
um, and a location on the east, uh, excuse me, on the west side of the island, which is great not only for songbird migrants, but for raptors, particularly the absolutely gorgeous swallowtail kites. Swallowtail kites will come from the southeast in the United States, down the peninsula, and go across Cuba, launched off Guanajuato on the on the western edge, and go off into Yucatan and point south. Other raptors, such as ospreys, and you're familiar with ospreys, I'm sure, will come down to Cuba, down, excuse me, um, the Florida Peninsula, across to Cuba, and go east through the rest of the Caribbean into South America, perhaps into the Amazon Basin. Anyhow, at Guanajacamibes, our friend Osmani Borrego is there. He's the uh, assistant director at the Guana. Acamibes National Park, and we are uh, distributing feeders, and lo and behold, we distribute also um, bird-oriented calendars. Uh, Osmani is really a terrific guy, and we'll now go to the north coast, the area around here. It is important to realize that this is not necessarily a unique place for birds, it's a place that's run, well, it has nice beaches and stuff, that's run for hard currency. Uh, the French, the Italians, the Canadians come there to go to uh, experience Cuba, uh, to go to some hotels, spend a week or more. They might as well be uh, somewhere else. They might as well be in on a ship because they don't really get a, a good taste of uh, Cuba. But it's a good place for our people to realize what kind of experience uh, the uh, Cuban uh, tourism industry is going through to get hard currency. We do see a couple of specialties there. Bahama Mockingbird will come to the North Coast, nowhere else in Cuba. Uh, the uh, uh, West Indian Whistling Duck is uh, most easily seen there, and we often find easily the Cuban net catcher here, and again, great lizard cuckoo. Uh, around the Cayo Coco area, uh, there's continued development. Uh, this road um, being looked down the road by our friend Ray Dell, who was one of, one of our tour leaders for the bus company in, 19, in 2016, uh, wasn't there the previous, the previous year. They're constantly building stuff uh, for tourists in hard currency. Ray Raydell uh, had a little pair of binoculars. Uh, we gave him a, a better pair, and he gave his pair to the bus driver. Um, Cayo Coco is very dry, and one way to attract birds is to hook up a camp shower. The local bird is there, and local bird tour leaders will hook up a camp shower and let it drain and spill into a, a, um, a bowl to attract a lot of the warblers that are coming through, because there isn't fresh water there, except under rare circumstances. Next, Baracoa is on the extreme uh, east end of the island. It's Soledad's favorite place. It is, it is, as they say here, beautiful, clean, and healthy. Great harbor here. Entry way into Parque Nacional Alejandro de Humboldt. Um, it is a park which is um, 275 square miles, and one of the places where the last ivory bill woodpecker in Cuba was spotted. Who knows? It may still be there. Here we are distributing stuff. Giovanni, the leader of the park, uh, is on the left with some feeders we gave him. There's yours truly with um, some other material that uh, we're handing. Uh, our friend El Indio, one of the rangers with a bird-oriented calendar, and Noel Viss, who's the snail specialist, the Palomita snail specialist uh, on the far end. Here we're looking through, uh, crossing one of the streams, waiting for uh, an ox cart to take us. Yes, we see Cuban emerald, Cuban parakeet, and the Palomitas, the Palomitas, the snails, characteristic of that part of Cuba. We will, um, if we're lucky, find a giant kingbird, very similar to the great kingbird, as I mentioned before, and the loggerhead kingbird, but much larger and thicker. Here's one of the hotels that we used to stay at. Certainly not tells me that it's closed now. And one of our friends with, with some of the uh, calendars that we're distributing, one of our friends who's a librarian 
there. Uh, and some of the difficulties, Baracoa is uh, heavily damaged by regular hurricanes coming through uh, Cuba. Moving very quickly, um, Baracoa and nearby Olguin uh, is one of the locations where Olguin is one of the difficult, difficult places for the bird trade. Our friend Carlos Pena in the hat, in the red hat here, and Lourdes Pena uh, with the poster here and pictured there uh, have to deal with this particular problem, and they're doing fairly well. Here's uh, uh, Lourdes with one of the posters they have to protect the birds from the bird trade. More on that later. Topas de Coyantes is the location where we've visited before. It's a beautiful place. It has hosted the 2017 uh, Birds Caribbean meeting. Um, and in this particular old hotel, it was a terrific event, 2017. Lovely mountains, great hiking, up and down hills, terrific birds like Cuban toady, like Cuban grass quit, um, which has uh, problems in the bird trade. A location where we brought and distributed, made contributions here. That was in my baggage alone. Uh, three binoculars, bunch of feeders, a camera, Ken Kaufman's book in Spanish, camping shower, which I mentioned to you before. It was a way to distribute this stuff. We'll touch on now very quickly the bird trade issue again, the equipment review, art and children, and getting there. Let's see, we're already... 45, 50 minutes into this. Here's the bird trade. It's a constant problem. This is in Baracoa. This is in Orguin. Uh, in previous years, locally, um, having a bird in a cage was a symbol of some upward mobility. And this, I believe, was a Cuban bullfinch. Here's Playa Larga on the left, Cuban bullfinch. Santiago de Cuba on the right, yellow a uh, face grass quit. Santa Clara here, Cuban bullfinch again. Santa Clara here, Cuban bullfinch again. Here's in Havana, Cuban bullfinch on the left. Our own indigo bunting from the United States on the right. Good news in Havana, however, um, they are cracking down on selling birds and it's um, not as common as it was a five or 10 years ago. Here's the bird trade, homemade, um, cage with um, a number of yellow-faced grass quit along uh, highway number one in the Vinales area. A wonderful article from National Geographic, April 22, 2022, uh, all for a song, which discusses the difficulties in the bird trade. Next on some equipment. I mentioned this equipment on the left that we brought to the Birds Caribbean meeting. How do we get it there? Well, most of our participants and participants from other groups, um, we're allowed two bags to bring in our participants and uh, they bring one bag and we give them another one uh, full of things like uh, binoculars, feeders, books, boots, uh, cameras, and other things to distribute while we're enjoying the birds. And that's what this, uh, this pair of uh, uh, luggage on uh, the right represents. Here's a fine book by our friend Niels Navarro. Niels seen here, The Endemic Birds of Cuba. It is the book to have. It is fine. It is both in English and in Spanish. And as Soledad will tell you, when you buy the book in English, that pays for the production and distribution of a parallel book in Spanish that's given away to our counterparts, particularly educators on the island shown on the right. It is uh, well done. Uh, he has done excellent work. Niels is a real hero in this sense. There are other books. There's the traditional old Birds of Cuba by Orlando Garrido and Arturo Carcano, uh, but it's also reproduced in Spanish uh, by uh, Cornell University Press. And there's Ken Kaufman's book, which I mentioned before, his field guide to Birds of North America, which he did about 15, 20 years ago. He also did a Spanish version on the right, mainly to distributing in Mexico, but it's almost as helpful in the Caribbean, in Spanish-speaking areas of the Caribbean, uh, Dominican Republic, 
Puerto Rico, and especially um, Cuba. It's good to understand the parts of the bird, both in English and in Spanish. You notice in, I put the green border around this one to know that uh, Corona is crown and Espalda is back and Cola is tail and Punta de Ala is wingtip and uh, uh, Barba is, is uh, chin and Bigotes uh, are whisker marks. So there you go. Sometimes it's handy with our with our colleagues. And I mentioned coloring books. This is one of Ediciones Nuevos Mundos run by uh, our friend Soledad, uh, Coloring My World, the uh, Cuban Parrot, a coloring book on that. This is us um, on interacting. We, uh, in a busload with Soledad, myself, and a bunch of other people, were finishing our bird operation going to Havana. Ernesto and our good friend Joni Ellis from Optics to the Tropics had just arrived in Havana and they were going east. But we decided to meet them on the Autopista Numero Uno, the first highway of, uh, of uh, Cuba, at a particular spot, because we had extra coloring books, which happened to be in Soledad's uh, plastic bag there, which we gave to Ernesto and Joni to distribute as they were going in. One hand washes the other. We all help each other. This is the way uh, it should be and the way it is. The way it is, is art and children. Here's what um, our friend Joni uh, created with uh, some t-shirts, uh, more free, more beautiful, uh, the birds breaking out of their cages. Here is the coloring book that um, our friends uh, at uh, Ediciones Nuevos Mundos uh, created. Here are kids playing with bird cards, young girls playing with bird cards. Here are kids distributing, um, using binoculars and telescopes that we've helped distribute. Our dear friend, uh, Betty Peterson, the late Betty Peterson was instrumental back 20 years ago doing this. Here is a scope that I found in one of Betty's um, collections. This is a scope I contributed about 20, 25 years ago and this is still having a second life. Um, I found this photo about five years ago, still being used by teachers and kids to uh, make bird education interact with bird conservation. There are a bunch of kids at a mural, the mural sponsored by the, um, at a school, these are girls during the pandemic, obviously. And the mural says, um, let's see, it says, these are the birds, oh, these birds are happier flying free than in uh, your home in cages. And this particular mural was sponsored by the Cape Cod Bird Club, misspelled as the Cape Cop Bird, Cape Cop Bird Club, but it was wonderful and um, a real charming uh, addition to what we do. Going, oh, Art and Children, this is uh, our friend Inez Shear, shown on the lower left, helping with uh, bird education with kids and, and painting murals. As Krista asked, uh, how do you get there? Who will take you? It's sometimes as hard as pulling out uh, a uh, worm from the sand, a plover pulling out a worm from the sand to find some of the stuff out. For Americans, it's sometimes particularly difficult because of the strange relationship between the United States and Cuba. But I also mentioned the Previously mentioned the Friendship Society. There's our friend um, who runs, uh, Gary Markowski, who runs uh, the Caribbean Conservation Trust. He does it for groups. And Joni Ellis also runs small groups um, up from Optics for the Tropics. And there are other organizations and uh, companies that do this stuff, stuff. But these are three of the options that I always recommend. Um, we go and uh, they go, we go, if there, if there are enough of us in a nice Chinese bus here. Um, our friend Sobi um, is the driver. You will notice this little pin he has. It's a cross pin of two flags, the U.S. and the Cuban flag. We distribute this uh, pin to promote uh, friendship and cooperation. Getting there, yep, here was our last bus trip uh, earlier this year. There were about 16 of us uh, on a bus, that bus that fits 24 people. It was a wonderful group. 
We saw more birds than we ever had before. It was uh, really terrific, a uh, terrific review. So wrapping up, what did we look at? Uh, we looked at three big places, main places, Las Terrazas, Zapata Swamp, and Havana, four side trips, Guanaja Caribes, North Coast, Baracoa, Topes de Coyantes, and the other engagements, very important. The whole bird trade problem, equipment view for, or equipment review for the uh, Cubans, getting them equipment that uh, they need and will use, particularly researchers like at the university and educators. Um, also art and children and getting there. Getting there, yeah, plan a trip to get there. One of the organizations that Soledad runs and that I am uh, close to is the Friendship Association. Uh, this was our trip in uh, uh, last year, in, uh, 2023 in January, and it uh, works very well. The important is, thing is not only the seabirds, but interact with Cuban nature, interact and support Cuban conservation and education, and help protect Cuban birds and American birds at the same time because uh, our birds migrate uh, through Cuba going through the Caribbean. Here's a picture from New Year's Day 2015 uh, at uh, Playa Larga. Um, myself, Joni Ellis there, uh, Ernesto, a group of other people, including Ivan Basic, right there. It represents uh, some of the best activities and possibilities for us. And now, I will wrap this up. You can go to Cuba. You can make a difference. You can uh, help uh, make bird conservation more meaningful for them and for us. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Paul. That was really wonderful. I appreciate it. Um, I uh, Everyone um, that's here, if you have any questions or comments that um, you'd like, uh, Paul, to answer, feel free to drop those in the chat. I just put his email address there. Um, and again, the replay for this will also be, and, and some of the other resources and everything will also be on our YouTube channel soon. And we'll, we'll send out some of those resources. Um, that was really wonderful. Oh, and uh, Soledad, if you want to jump on or if there's anything that you want to say, just let me know and I can unmute you. Um, I have it. I have it automatically muting everybody right now. So just let me know. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. That was really wonderful. Um, I am glad that you shared the best way to visit too, and that there are a number of different ways that people can experience Cuba and its wonderful culture and uh, birds as well. Um, and I am curious about a couple of different things. I have some questions. So just as we as we Super. wait for others to um to drop any questions if they have anything. Um oh I see you saw that. Great, thank you. Uh oh, Soledad here. I can unmute you just a second. Let's see if this works. There we go. Hmm. Derek, do you know how I might be able to unmute her? Yeah. Oh, there we go. I did it. How are you, Soledad? Hi. Hello. Uh, I guess. What did I get wrong? What should you emphasize? Because you no. know more about this than I do. Can, can you hear me? Can yes. you hear yep, we can hear you. I, I I thought it was great. I learned a lot. <laughs> I always I always learn something whenever Paul gives a talk. No, it was great. Um, uh, the only thing I could add is to tell folks about uh, uh, that we're going to be doing a trip this February, and um, that you know that it should be exciting as always. And uh, uh, the situation in Cuba is quite drastic at the moment, and they're begging for people to come because they need they need us to come but uh so that's sort of a you know a, a a little bit different from last year and from this year even i mean we saw it we saw a lot of hardship but i think it's going to be a lot worse uh it's a lot worse from what from what people are telling me 
Um, but in any case, we will be doing a trip either end of January or beginning of February, probably beginning of February. Paul, what do you, did you have some? some no, I would just stress, I mean, in terms of having people know, it was difficult this trip. Um, the uh, fuel situation was extremely difficult. A wonderful driver uh, had to be on his toes at all times to find out where to refuel, even at his own company depots. It was off and on. Sometimes the power was off. That's the second problem. Electricity outages. We were stuck in Havana like four extra hours. It was it was both uh, trying and, a, and a, a, an adventure. And uh, there's a whole story about that, but I'll, I'll save it. No, there's fuel problems, there's power problems, and, and the, the food situation, um, our, our trip people and Soledad can, uh, people on the trip, yeah, but they're well fed, but it's a lot more expensive than it was four or five years ago. Um, but uh, our counterparts there need us to come. They want us to come. They are wonderful people. Uh, we interact with them in creative, in gr their gracious, creative ways. Um, they they love Americans. They love us. They love the birds. They love to show us the birds. Right. And Soledad, would you ditto that? Oh, definitely, definitely, and and, um, and and of course, the birds are still there, and the birds are still. Uh, I mean that 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 is that's never a problem, and I think mm -hmm. that. Uh, we will have the we will have the similar problems that we had this year. Uh, I don't think they'll be worse for us, um, but I think it's important to continue to to show solidarity and to continue to go to Cuba. I think the best times, and, and you can correct me, Soledad, um, in my experience, and yours is much longer than mine, um, was during the uh, Obama years. Oh gosh. Um, when the, there, there were plenty of American tourists as well as uh, European tourists there and Canadian tourists and eco tourists. It was, we got so jaded. Soledad and I were complaining about how many tourists there were there in Havana and elsewhere. And uh, now some of these places are empty um, insofar as they, uh, the Cubans had to virtually shut down during COVID. Um, Cuba did very well with protecting its own people. It created its own two uh, serums to fight COVID and everybody was vaccinated or else. Everybody was vaccinated, but there was there was loss of, of life at the beginning of this. But um, the, the tourist trade never picked up. E even the eco-tourist trade has not picked up after the pandemic. Uh, and it, there was a double, double, uh, whammy for the Cubans. One was the pandemic, and the other thing was uh, the the Trump administration. Uh, he was he was thrilled to shut down any connections that had been achieved and, uh, and accomplished in the previous administration. And perhaps it's because he has a an orientation toward uh, hotels and casinos that he uh, I think he made uh, Cuba a. Uh, uh, in particular, a uh, target for misery. Uh, but, um, um, and just really quick, uh, we have a couple of extra questions I wanted to make sure we get to as well. What? Um, Am I still a, 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 alive? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I was just reading them. What's the best time of the year to visit? January, great. February, yes. Uh, January and February are great times. Uh, so are March and April. Um, of course, if you get into nesting, breeding and nesting, you want to, in terms of birding, you want to be very careful uh, birding around nesting time. And uh, we we kind of don't like to bird after March. I don't know. Um, some people continue into April, but I prefer February. And also the climate's much better. When people are not a, a used to the heat, uh, the climate is much better in January, February. It's a great time for birding. It's a great time. Best time, I think. Uh, great overview and very time to plan. Okay. How much time to spend for a birding trip? Minimum, I would say, Paul, what, 10 days, 11 ten, days? 10, 10 to 14 days, up, almost, up, almost two weeks. I mean, that, you get a good feeling. You get the core location that the three core locations that I that we mentioned, and one or two of the other ones. 
Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. Um, and I know uh, Venk also asked, what's the best way to contact the guides and drivers you mentioned? Well, well, the guides and drivers are connected by the institutions who bring them. Um, and I would I would Google those three organizations that I mentioned that we mentioned for finding out when their trips are, and the guides and drivers will take care of you. For Americans, you can't just drop yeah. drop everything and fly to Cuba. It's uh, very complicated now, and you have to have one or, or two or three official reasons and be brought and sponsored by a officially officially designated and uh, uh, chartered company. Correct, something that. Yeah. Yeah. At the moment. Yeah. At the moment. Yeah. Okay, that's great information. Thank you. Um, and Arian, I'm not sure um, which location you're referring to, if you could clarify in the comments, unless Soledad or Paul, you know. Um, um, but yeah, oh, go ahead, Soledad. Vinales, Vinales area. Uh, yeah, so Soroa, Vinales, or Soroa first. Soroa and Vinales, yeah, that combined, we do that. Yeah. And we and we stay at the home of of uh, our friends Neil, Niels Navarro and his neighbor. We oh, stay yeah. with him and his wife, and it's just terrific. Oh, oh that's have, wonderful. I have one uh, thing to say about about Niels uh, and about the books. Um, Niels is in the in the middle of writing uh, an up to date version. This is his Endemic Birds of Cuba, which is a great book. But he's he's in the middle of writing. Uh, an up-to-date, really, version of uh, the birds of Cuba. And and uh, if we ever get it out, uh, it'll be great. Uh, it's taking a long time. Uh, they're pro he's having problems because he does all his own drawings, all his own uh, uh, illustrations, and uh, the electricity is off more than it's on. So if he's, you know, if he has electricity one hour a day, or two hours a day, he has to run and do that, and may, may, might be in the middle of the night. So anyway, we're kind of behind on the book, but um, it's you know coming soon. Uh, it should be the definitive uh, book on the birds of Cuba. And That's so. great, Soledad. Thank you for that information. I am curious too. Uh, you mentioned that every time um, an English version is purchased, a Spanish version is um, also distributed. Um, for education purposes. Does that matter where you purchase that from or can it be any purchase of that book? Is that direct through his website or so it, it Amazon or? Paul, did you want to say something? No, no, I'm, 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 you should answer, Soledad. This was a great project. It was a great project. Um, Unfortunately, we've we ran out of books at a certain point. I mean, the book's been out for uh, what 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 is it? Uh, maybe ten, almost ten years now, and we've yeah, run two thousand fifteen. We've, we've done a second edition of the English, book, but we have not done a second edition of the Spanish book. Um, everybody I know in Cuba, every biologist, every library, everybody who's studying biology. Uh, everybody has the Spanish book. Um, there may, you know, there are obviously going to be a fresh group of uh, of uh, students and all that that will that will not have it. But but at the moment we are out of the Spanish version, and I, we have this a few of the second edition, uh, which are which uh, Lisa Sorensen has now uh, Birds Caribbean. She has them because. I'm away so much of the time. Uh, I I couldn't keep up with sending them out and things like that. But the book, the money, any money from those books goes right back into the fund for the new book. Whatever whatever book books are sold goes right into a fund for the new book. Perfect. Okay. It's pretty expensive. I mean, it's going to be very. Um, I don't know how many pay. It'll be big. It'll be, you know, it's almost 400 birds. So. It looks really comprehensive. Yeah, that's great, though. Um, 
and the coloring book that looks really fantastic mm. as well. Um, where's the best place to get that? Do you know? Well, um, if I ever get back to the United States, I'll send you. Cook. Actually, we have uh, it's a series. It's not just one book. Oh, uh, fun! It's on endangered uh, endangered species, not necessarily birds. Uh, we have one on the polymita, on the snail, one on the manatee, one on the hutia, and one on the cotora. And we're doing a book on the mangroves. Mm. Yeah. Very so, cool. So it's you know it's 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 really focuses on, and they're coloring books for children, and um, and they focuses on and uh, endangered uh, species that are endangered that are, you know and and they're very educational. I mean, the whole, the everything we, 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 we send them to schools because we want the teachers to teach to that book in, in, in their classes. Sure. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I'd be it happy looks to <laughs> when I get back to the States. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, it just, it looks incredible. I'm sure me and a lot of other people would love to have something like that at some point. So um, we'll keep us updated on, on those things too. Um, send me an email and I will, and I will, as soon as I get back to the States, I'll send you some. Sure. Sure. I, Thanks. So does. On, you know, on Amazon or anything like that. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Um, and, uh, oh, what's that? Sorry. They're for Cuba. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, that sounds, that sounds great. Um, and I wanted to uh, mention to Elaine, uh, said that, uh, you said you were on the February, 2024 friendship association trip. Cannot recommend it highly enough for anyone interested. And, um, Yvonne said, yes, agree with Elaine. It was such an excellent trip. Um, want to return hopefully with the upcoming trip early next year. Keep me posted. Um, so that's wonderful um, that, yeah, others have had also had a wonderful time there and everything like that, too. So thank you so much, um, Paul and Soledad and everyone for being here and for presenting uh, on everything that you all the knowledge that you have about Cuba and um, its culture and its birds there. It was really, really great to hear hear about all of that, too. I'm hoping that I can also get on one of your trips at some point in the future. Fingers crossed. Um, and Derek, did you have anything you wanted to add before we um, before we jump off here? I know we're about almost 15 minutes after the hour. So, No, just to say thank you, Paul, very much. And hopefully some of the people that were here today will come back for, for next month's webinar, um, oh. which is on uh, birthing in Southern Africa. Oh, wow. Extens extended Southern Africa. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. And if you go to our Learn the Birds website uh, or you're on our email list, you will see uh, all the upcoming webinars that we have um, and including one that Derek's going to be giving in August on um, uh, bird colors. Um, I think I got that right. Uh, color as uh, color as as made, seen. Uh, let me try that again. Color as evolved, made and seen. In birth. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that one too. Um, so we've got some exciting stuff coming up. Um, when we send out information about the YouTube um, video, when it's posted uh, for this recording and, and the presentation and everything, uh, we can also include some of the helpful information and links that Paul and Soledad uh, provided to us as well. So thank you again so much for taking the time uh, to be here, Paul, and to, to present. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Krista and Derek. It was a delight. Have a great Appreciate day. Appreciate it. Bye bye, thank everyone. Thank you too. And thank you, Soledad. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye, y'all.